Hello, and today is November 5th. It is about 8.30 p.m. here in Israel, 1.30 p.m. on the Eastern Coast in the United States. And let's get started. First, good news. Um, and there's a lot of good news, thank God. We are devastating Hamas and Hezbollah. We have reached across um, the entire Gaza, split north and south, and Hamas can no longer send supplies north and south, and the north is quickly running out of supplies. We are able to send our trucks, our supply trucks, straight across that line in the middle of Gaza now from east to uh, east to west. And we're uh, right, we are east of Gaza, so we're able to send our trucks all the way to the west towards the Mediterranean. Um, there's only a three kilometer space of land that we do not control on the coastline. And Gaza City and the two other main cities of uh, that Hamas and Palestinian terrorists are holed up in are quickly under siege. And, uh, and we, are, we are gaining ground there. Also in the north against Hezbollah, we have, uh, we've had tremendous success at bombing out Hezbollah positions. And, uh, and this is great. Again, as time goes on, we're going to see more and more success from Israel's perspective um, and from Israel's side against the Palestinian terrorists for a very simple reason. We have more people, we have better arms, we're better supplied, and we can keep resupplying ourselves while Hamas doesn't have any of those advantages. Uh, the one advantage Hamas has are tunnels where they can hide, um, and they're using them not as effectively as, as people had expected. Um, and they also have on the streets, they have urban war warfare, that when we have to go street by street, um, the advantage is theirs because they have home field advantage. They recognize they know the streets, and they set up um, traps for soldiers as they come through. But um, the IDF has mitigated those advantages um, to this point, by locating members of the terrorists and uh, and homing in on them, and then instead of coming after them on foot, they call on airstrikes either by drones or by jets, and that's a way to ensure that we can you know, instead of going into a building and then trying to find them and avoiding all these traps, just call in a uh, a a uh, airdrop of bombs. Plane comes in, drone comes in, drops a bomb, and that's it. So, for instance, um, Hamas had thought one of the advantages that they'd set up are um, are uh, guns and uh, and missile launchers on rooftops. So that way, when the IDF came in by street, they'd have the height advantage and be able to shoot down at the IDF. Instead of the IDF falling in for those traps, they located either by satellite imaging or however they do it um, where those rooftop launch pads would be. And then they just called an airstrike, took out the building, and that's the end of the uh, of the Hamas advantage. Or the, uh, the yeah, so that's good. Okay, people are talking about politically about a pause for hostages, you know, pausing the fighting, um, and then in return, Israel's demanding all the hostages. Um, Israel's demanding all the hostages. So if they want a if um, if the Palestinians are going to request a uh, a pause in fighting. The price for that pause will be all the hostages. Less than the hostages, then they don't deserve a pause, and there's no reason for that. Uh, one of the things that people have been concerned about and asking me about uh, is the airstrike last week on Jabalaya refugee camp. Now, refugee camp is, gives you a picture of tents and poor people in tents and, and shoddy conditions. It's a full city. They call it a refugee camp because 50 years ago it was a refugee camp. It hasn't been a refugee camp in decades. It's fully built up. Um, now, there was a Hamas tunnel under the Jabalaya refugee camp. Israel bombed the tunnel, and then when it bombed the tunnel and the explosion spread through the tunnel, it collapsed the street on top of it. When Hamas builds their tunnels, they're not so concerned with the structure of the streets and keeping it strong. They're concerned about the tunnel. So when the tunnel exploded, it weakened the street and the street fell in. And that's why we saw so, so much uh, mayhem and, and destruction wasn't because the bomb was such a large bomb, it was because of the construction that, that, uh, that Hamas had done. Uh, Hamas made a deal where, uh, with, with uh, brokered by the United States and Egypt um, and Qatar, where they would send out um, foreign nationals, people with, with uh, dual passports. So for instance, there were 600 Americans. Um, they would send out those Americans and also injured civilian Gazans so they could get medical attention. Egypt agreed to take them. What ended up happening was Hamas lied to the United States, and a third of the people that they put on to onto ambulances to send out were actually Hamas fighters that were injured. They were sh strictly and specifically prohibited by the United States as part of the deal, and Hamas lied. Um, it should be—it's amazing to me that 
um, that the United States is brokering deals with Hamas, thinking that Hamas is going to be honest. Uh, Hamas has been found to, right, over the weekend, uh, put their fighters in ambulances, uh, uh, um, exaggerate numbers, whether it's the, the, the hospital bombing and exaggerate who did the hospital bombing, straight out lie about it, um, or numbers of the uh, Jabalaya refugee camp that we just mentioned that within 10 minutes they had a uh, they had a 400 person body count, which you it, most people would have trouble counting to 400 that quickly, let alone counting 400 things like bodies, um, and let alone in a disaster that would normally take weeks to uncover bodies, they were able to do it. So it's, it's really mind boggling that anybody thinks that a deal can be struck with Hamas that they would keep it. Um, they are clearly not to be trusted and not honest. Um, and again, just surprising that uh, world powers keep falling for this. I think it's a general trend where we, uh, we, we t the Western mind tends to project onto people that don't think like them that assume that they think the same way. Um, they don't realize that it's perfectly acceptable uh, for a terrorist to lie to his enemy. I don't know if you can hear the jet flying by now, but okay. Um, Nasrallah, who was the head of Hezbollah, um, was supposed to give this huge uh, speech on Friday. And uh, like a coward, he hung, in a, he hung out in a bunker, hid in a bunker while he gave the speech on a big screen. And uh, it was a nothing burger. He actually came up with some ridiculous claims like uh, the Jews were drunk from Simchas Torah and therefore woke up in the morning, saw that there was a small attack by members of Hamas against soldiers and were so upset by it and still so drunk that they decided to kill all their own people and Hamas didn't really do anything. Um, Palestinian terrorists weren't involved. It was mostly Jews that did this. I don't know how you explain the hostages, but beyond me. Um, big news, which could be seen as bad news or good news, depending on how you look at it, was that Hezbollah um, and Hamas were both supplied with this super missile by Iran that, they, that Israel was aware of, but they had not used it yet. Um, and they used it over the weekend. They fired yesterday. A, it's a thousand kilometer per hour rocket that can go 250 kilometers. So they fired one from Lebanon. Israel, I don't, I, I, this is beyond me how they're able to do this. I know it's doable and that they did it. Israel was able to redirect the missile in midair to a different location where it blew up in a field, but that the bomb blast was so big and the smoke cloud was, you could see how powerful these missiles are. The other one was fired from Gaza to a lot, and the idea being showing just how far the range is of these missiles. Of course, the farther you fire it, the easier it is for Israel to knock it down, which it did. It used again successfully the Arrow missile, which is the, uh, the defense system that's the next generation after Iron Dome. Uh, was able to track the missile and blow it out of the sky before it caused any damage. So on the one hand, it's a little concerning that they have such a powerful missile. On the other hand, it's clear that our defenses can take care of it. Um, okay, it's called the Aish missile. I looked down at my notes here. Okay, um, bad news. So bad news is uh, an Israeli was killed up north. Um, that's uh, by a Hezbollah missile. So that's a that's bad news. That's not something that we that we're happy about it all, um, that Hezbollah was able to, to kill a, a civilian. Of course, they're killing civilians. And, uh, and another thing that's a little concerning to me that I think is bad news is that among young Democrats and young Americans um, in, in general, but Democrats also, Israel seems to be losing support. Um, but shockingly, there, are, there is support not just for Palestinians, but actually for the Hamas attacks among young Americans. That's a little... That's disturbing. It's disturbing that um, you know, either people aren't believing about the, how bad the atrocities are, or they're just uh, okay with it. I don't know, but it's, it's concerning. Okay, let's do a little analysis. Um, even Senator Bernie Sanders, who is no friend of Israel, came out and was against the ceasefire. Um, the difference between a pause and a ceasefire is a ceasefire is, is that's essentially the end of the war. Um, that's where we say, okay, it's over, everybody stop firing, and let's go home. That's a ceasefire. Um, a ceasefire is everybody keeps saying, doesn't matter who it is, everybody says a ceasefire is a victory for Hamas because they will continue to fight on another day. That's an untenable position for Israel. Israel cannot allow Hamas to fight another day. They've got to wipe them out. So a ceasefire is, uh, is something that nobody's talking about. The reason why people are, keep pushing a ceasefire um, one is either because they hate Israel and they know exactly what they're doing um, and what they're what they're suggesting, 
or because they are concerned about humanitarian conditions in Gaza and saying that no matter what is going to happen the day after, we have to stop and save the people. It's an admirable position, but it's short-sighted because it doesn't understand that if Hamas lives another day, then there's going to be more and more humanitarian crisis in Gaza. So not that we're trading one humanitarian crisis for another, but to keep Hamas around is not good for Israel, it's not good for the Palestinians, it's not good for the world. Um, okay, America seems to be completely addicted to the two-state solution, and even though every Israeli will look at it and say, what in the world are you talking about? Why would you bring this up now? You didn't bring it up before the war, now you want to bring it up? And Americans see an opportunity um, that maybe, uh, maybe now, after we get rid of Hamas, we could bring in a revitalized Palestinian Authority that could then take control of Gaza and the, and the West Bank. I don't know why anyone, seeing how the Palestinian Authority is active, can even suggest such a thing, but they keep suggesting it. Um, it's a, uh, it's, the, the Palestinian Authority has, has a lack of, of leadership and uh, just, um, just odd, very, very strange. Okay. Um, the uh, Hamas, one of the ways that they're, that they're battling now is they hung out in tunnels. Israel's found many, many of their tunnels, but some they have yet to locate. So when Israel takes over areas in, in the Gaza Strip, um, what, could be hap what, it, what is happening is that some of the tunnels, they've gone over without detecting them. And then what ends up happening is Hamas pops up from behind them. Um, and Israel then has to has to fend that off from attacks from behind. So it's not just it's not that the land that we've taken is so clearly ours yet, and is clearly uh, Hamas free. We still have to uh, we still have to find more and more of these tunnels. Okay, um, two disturbing um, comments by members of the Knesset. One was uh, was a member of the right wing party. Um, one of the right-wing parties that said, uh, as, 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 this is Knesset member Eliyahu, uh, who I like, and he's a good guy, but he said uh, you know, carelessly that maybe we should consider nuking Gaza. He said, then you know, excused the wine by saying he was speaking metaphorically. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu rightly suspended him from government meetings um, to get the point across that this is not something that we would ever consider. Um, and members of Knesset have to be a little more responsible. At the same time, a member of the Ra'am party, which is a Arab party in the Israeli, uh, in the Israeli Knesset, said that uh, she saw no evidence that there were rapes. None of the videos um, had rapes on them. Um, to th it would be beyond me to think that this would you know, uh, act as evidence. And then she admitted she didn't even see the videos. So she doesn't even know that there was no rape on videos, but um, just horrific. And to his credit, uh, Mansour Abbas, not Mahmoud Abbas, Mansour Abbas was the head of the the Ram Party called her out on it and said, "There's no, there's no room for that at all." Um, he's actually been uh, wonderful on in this war, so that was very good. Okay, let's get uh, let's get to your questions, and uh, and we'll go from uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so uh, what the one question is, what is the tanks? I guess maybe it's when is the tank? When are the tanks going to hit in Gaza, or what are they trying to hit in Gaza? Tanks um, hit big positions where we know that there are <clears throat> Hamas members. Tanks are also good transport vehicles, but if there's a building or something that, that needs to be taken out, so a tank can take out that building. Uh, wouldn't it be smarter for Netanyahu to resign after the war so the day-to-day -day operations that are going on don't have to face more change? Um, yeah, so that's, that's definitely, uh, yeah, I mean, his calculation seems to be that he wants to be prime minister for years after this, but uh, definitely, it's it's uh, it's difficult if he resigns in the middle and then there's a change in leadership right in the middle. Israel would be able to handle that. That wouldn't be something that Israel wouldn't be able to handle. Um, but it would be it would be uh, disconcerting to say the least if we had a change in leadership now. Um, how long do I think the IDF will be in Gaza for? It's a question we keep getting. Um, well, we don't know, but expected about two months at, in the least. Okay. Um, is the terrorist group Hezbollah only in Lebanon or in other countries too? So the Hezbollah group is. Is stationed in South Lebanon, but it also um, it also operates in Syria, and uh, and th those are the two areas that Hezbollah is mostly active in Lebanon and in in Syria. How did the civilians of Gaza choose to elect such horrifying terrorists? Do they know that the horrors they were capable of doing? So no, so the the civilians in Gaza. Let's keep something in mind here, okay? Civilians in Gaza. What what qualifies you as a civilian? It means that you didn't pick up a gun, right? That mean that's your civilian, okay? Now, those civilians in Gaza, polls show 
they might not like the way Hamas governs. They might not like um, they might not like the way Hamas is corrupt, but they share an ideology with Hamas in terms of their its relationship with Israel. It all, they also want Israel destroyed. It's it's kind of like a little shocking to me, like how many people fall for this idea that there are there are innocent Gazans. There are there are three types of people in Gaza right now, excluding children. Let's set aside children because children don't have um, the capabilities of understanding what's going on around them and don't have the capabilities of of reaching their own decisions based on information that they're provided to by their parents. So excluding children, there are three types of people in Gaza now. There are people that have killed Jews on October seventh. There are people that are trying to kill Jews now. Those are those overlap. Then there are people that support those that have killed and have tried to kill. There are no large groups of people that look at what happened on October 7th and say, that shouldn't have happened. We reject that. So they, they agree with Hamas's charter that says that Israel has to be annihilated and all Jews have to die. 93% of Palestinians in polling have, uh, hold anti-Semitic views, 93%. So when people say Palestinians aren't Hamas and Hamas aren't Palestinians, it might only be because they don't have the option to be members of Hamas, not because they don't agree with Hamas's positions. And when people say that that they disagree with Hamas's rule or are not in favor of Hamas's rule, it's their rule that they're not in favor of, not the ideology as it pertains to killing and destroying Jews. Okay. Um, so also to answer your question, how do they how do they elect such people? Because they share common values with them. At the same time, Hamas also provides social services. We've all seen the day camps that they provide for children on their vacations, where children dress up as Hamas fighters, put on suicide vests, and talk about being a shaheed, being a martyr, and dying and killing Jews. Okay, um, what could Israel do with those warships? And do you think all the other terrorist groups are going to join the war? So I think if you're talking about the ships in the water, they bomb places in Gaza. They have large cannons on them, and they're able to direct bombings into Gaza. Uh, our other terrorist groups are already in the war. There are six terrorist groups fighting in Gaza right now. Uh, it's not just Hamas. So this talking point of it just being Hamas is just a talking point. It's a talking point because it makes everybody feel good. That way they can point to and say that not everybody's bad. It's just this terror group that's bad. If you just look, if you look at my Instagram today, I have, I have the, the graphic. Of a, of a picture of, of one of the hostages being taken, being kidnapped, and it shows how only one of the people in the kidnapping, like helping in the kidnapping, was a member of Hamas. Everybody else was a Gazan civilian. Okay. Um, what positive and negative effects can Netanyahu resigning in the middle of war have on Israel? If uh, Bibi Netanyahu resigned in the middle of the war, um, it could throw things into chaos. It might, may, might even improve things. We don't know. That's, but, but it won't happen. He's not going to resign in the middle. What could happen if other terrorist groups join this war against Israel? Um, we got a lot more fighting, but again, other terrorist groups have joined in. If Hezbollah joins in, then we're talking about something close to a regional conflict, and that would be uh, that would be really uh, really bad. Okay, um, I thought Lebanon's government was stopping Hezbollah from getting involved in the war. Is this not true? Since they are launching rockets over to Israel, how did the Lebanese people and government react to this? So keep in mind, first of all that 40% of the Lebanese government is Hamas. Hamas is also a political, is a Hezbollah, excuse me. Hezbollah is also a political party in the Lebanese government. So when you say the Lebanese government, that 40% of that government is, is Hezbollah. Now, this other 60% of the Lebanese government does not want Hezbollah to start bombing because if Hezbollah started bombing, uh, so then Israel is going to bomb Lebanon. Israel has stated for over 10 years that the next time Hezbollah starts seriously fighting Israel, Israel will take out the entire infrastructure, whether it be water, electricity, airports, seaports, highways, bridges, every single thing will be destroyed in Lebanon. It'll be almost uninhabitable for years. That's been the threat. And that threat has held Hezbollah back from attacking because they know they won't have the people support at that point because there won't be a Lebanon left. Um, so that's acted as a deterrent. I, I think Hezbollah realizes this and realizes that the United States would, would, also, be, uh, would also get involved. Okay, does Israel have any technology that can see where the tunnels in Gaza are, or do they have to find them by going door to door? So there is, it's a good question, there is technology that detects tunnels, but it's not, it's not always as effective as we'd like it to be. Um, so and Israel doesn't have to go door to door. What it's doing now is it's trying to draw out Hamas fighters, and by having drones in the air, it can see where they're coming out of. 
So that's a lot of how they're detecting uh, and detecting tunnels. Why has their four movement support for Israel decreased by so much? They, their Jews should be supporting Israel. So why has support for Israel dropped at such a difficult time? So a lot of Jews don't have the same values as maybe some of the other Jews that are that are watching this video. Um, Jews don't don't have one train of thought, and not all Jews appreciate how great of a gift the state of Israel is to the Jewish people. So they might not be pro-Israel. Um, in addition, they their value system might say that it's more important for for Israel to risk their own soldiers' lives than or, and their own civilian lives than to carry out mass bombings in, in Gaza. They may think that that's such a, a morally rep reprehensible thing to do that they sh that uh, it's better for Israel not to do it. And then when Israel does do it and doesn't take their advice or or their advocacy, so then they get upset at Israel and won't go. So that's why you could be seeing um, dropping um, reform. Um, given the complexities of the war, wouldn't Netanyahu stepping down affect the country's political dynamics? Yes, it will completely change everything in the country if Benjamin Netanyahu stepped down. I don't know what the next day would look like. Okay, do you believe that, that Netanyahu is the right man to lead Israel at this time? <sighs> um, I think he's the only one during this war that can lead. And I'm going to reserve, I, I have a lot of, a lot of issues of what happened leading up to this, um, but I'm going to reserve judgment. At the beginning of the war, I was very um, adamant about my opinions of, of Prime Minister Netanyahu and they had switched. Um, they're starting to evolve back and forth and back and forth. I'm undecided. I want to see how the war goes out. So put me in the undecided column on, uh, on the future of my support for, for Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, how do Israelis feel about rising uh, civilian casualty counts in Gaza? Is that something they follow closely? So Israelis, first and foremost, when you say rising, there are rising civilian deaths. Obviously, every day you're going to have more civilian deaths. But the numbers that you're seeing coming out of Gaza are put out by Hamas. They are completely false. There's not an ounce of truth to them. Now, I, nobody knows how many people have died in, in Hamas. I mean, Hamas has pulled off such ridiculous things as, as putting live people in body bags so the, just to create an image of, of how many dead there are. Kids that are pretending to be dead that are not dead. Uh, kids wearing makeup that makes it look like they were just in a bombing. You can't trust anything that comes out. That being said, we know that there are civilians dying because that's, that's what happens. Civilians die as, as part of any war. It's not something that anybody wants. It's not something that anybody's happy with, but it is the reality. Um, so, uh, so that is something that Israelis follow. But Israelis at this point really don't have, I mean, Israelis would never tolerate if we found out that um, people were being, were being targeted, civilians were being targeted by the Israeli military. But the way the Israelis look at this is that we have to get rid of Hamas. Our safety and security is on the line here. And if that means that, the, that and, and they went after our civilians. So this is how war is fought. So we try to minimize as much civilian casualties as possible, but we're not going to sit here and say that our objectives in war should be set aside for the safety and security of civilians in Gaza, especially when those, you know, those people are not exactly innocent bystanders to this, problem, to this crime. A lot of people with the, within the U.S. have been voicing alternatives to the war, right? I think you may be referring to ceasefires. Um, does anyone in Israel take these seriously? Does anyone in Israel suggest action besides war? Uh, there is no action besides war. Hamas is not going to surrender, right? It's, it's surrender or die. That's the, that's, those are Hamas's options. So a ceasefire just means that Hamas gets to go home and fight another day. Surrender, if Hamas surrender, that would be great, but there's no reason for them to surrender, right? That's not going to happen. Okay, how do Israelis feel about declining Jewish American support for the war? Is this something they're concerned about? Israelis are, look, and there's a famous line of the, when uh, Menachem Begin was the prime minister and, uh, and uh, a certain senator who's today president, you know, war, warned them that they, they could risk losing American support. This is something that always happens. Whenever Israel defends itself, the numbers of Israeli support it goes down. It makes sense because when Israel is not fighting, so then everybody loves Israel or more people love Israel. When they start to fight, people start to say, oh, I don't like those pictures I'm seeing on social media. So, so the numbers always go down and people always stay, say you're going to lose American support. Okay, Congress right now is voting 97% in favor of Israel. It would take a decade for that, for that support to erode 
if Israel never did anything positive to get it back. So if like, Israel kept doing bad things, it would take a, about a decade to, to erode all of that support. And that's not going to happen. So, but Israel, but the Menachem Begin answered that senator by saying that we had a, we had a, 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 a you know, the Jewish people lasted 3,000 years without American aid. We'll go the next 3,000 years without it also. Israel is, is very resourceful and very resilient. So we're concerned somewhat by declining American number support, but we know that it goes in a cycle and we know that it bounces back at a certain point and we're confident with that. And if we can't be confident with that, okay. Uh, with the war happening in Israel, what does Jewish law and tradition say about how we should think and act during such a difficult time? We have to pray, we have to repent, we have to give charity. That's what, that's what our average lives cannot go on as normal. Those of us not fighting cannot live our lives as normal. We must be, there must be a remarkable change in our lifetime. Somebody has to be able to say and say, what, what, how are you different since October 7th? If you can't answer that question in a definitive way, how are you different? Other than I, my mind is always like, uh, you know, I go from being depressed to being determined to being, I'm uh, talking about how you've improved as a person. If you can't definitively say that, that's a problem. That's a real problem. We cannot go the same way. So prayer, charity, repentance. That's how we do it in, in Judaism. Politicians keep talking about the rise in Islamophobia across the United States and other countries, but I'm not really seeing any specific instances like I'm seeing with anti-Semitism. Is there anything you've seen as bad as what's happening with Jews? So no, there's nothing as bad as what's happening with Jews. And I can't understand for the life of me why politicians, and this has been going on for three, four years already, whenever you talk about anti-Semitism, they have to say there's also anti-Islamophobia. As if like, if you don't mention it, like uh, then, then you're ignoring the problem though. Now in the beginning of the war, there was this man in Chicago that went absolutely ballistic and killed a six-year-old Palestinian kid in Chicago and uh, I think one of his parents. Um, so that was an example of Islamophobia. And then everybody said, yeah, the, the White House press secretary, when she was asked, this is a spokesperson for the, for the president of the United States, was asked about rising anti-Semitism, answered about Islamophobia. It's like this, this like sickness that we have that we can't admit yeah, Jews are under attack, and, no, and, and we don't have to mention anybody else. I don't know why. So yes, there's a small rise in Islamophobia, not as much as, as we would think, but it's almost like you're not politically correct if you don't mention the, uh, the rise in Islamophobia when you talk about um, anti-Semitism. Okay, let's have, that's the end of today's video. Um, we'll try to be here tomorrow and put another video together. Wish you a, uh, a peaceful night, and the Jewish people should be victorious. The state of Israel should be victorious. We should live on um, for in safety and security. Hostages should, should come home. Shalom.